we would always have to pee them in front and the pee people in the back. Oh, so, uh, so. I guess they get together. We were having them together. Interesting, <laughs> interesting. Okay. <laughs> so, um, any questions starting out from anything we covered? It feels like it's been so long. What, two weeks since we met? How was everyone's Thanksgiving? Everyone's still full from from then. Yeah, still dealing with the aftermath. That's okay. All right, uh, so we're gonna finish up our GI section today, and then we'll move into the the renal stuff. So we have um, today, and then next week, and then that's it. We're done for farm one. So we're almost there. Well, you have a whole other semester of me, so don't don't worry. <laughs> don't get too sentimental. Wait till after the next test. Um, so we were talking about antiemetics. What are some classes of antiemetics that we we were using? Serotonin antagonist. What's a good example of that? On dancitron. On or Zofran, right? So that's a that's a gold standard. Like everyone goes with that nowadays, right? What else do we have? Histamine good. So what are some examples of histamine blockers? Benergan. Benergan. Remember, it's not so much that there are histamine blockers; they're also anti-muscarinic, right? That's the big thing as well, and that goes into a lot of the side effects you're going to see with things like Fenergan, things like what else do we have? So copolamine, yeah, that was a pure anti right? right? What, what kind of side effects did you see? My dryas is so Why don't why pupils? What else? What's the biggest one? Dry mouth. You see, yeah, you can see dry mouth. What else? Constipation. These are all right, but what's the big? Sedation's the biggest one, right? That's the big thing. Because again, if I'm feeling super sick and you want to like just knock someone out, just like go to sleep. That's a great drug for that, right? But if they're like, I still have to go to work. I just don't want to be nauseous for it, right? Then, then something like that may not be the best option, especially if they're operating heavy machinery. Maybe something like Zofran might be a little bit better, okay? So it kind of depends on what you're trying to go for with the different goals are going to be there, right? Um, so another class we have is are going to be the cannabinoids. We'll probably talk a little bit about cannabinoids. Oh, yes, ma'am. Yeah. You can still see some sedation with that, but the thing with that drug is it's going to have a bit of a more slow onset of the drug, so uh, you may not see that as, as as big of a deal with that, but certainly you can still see some sedation from it. Mm -hmm. yeah, anything with an anti muscarinic activity, you can see some of that, um, just like with Benadryl, just like with anything else. But moving into the cannabinoids, now where do we normally find cannabinoids naturally in the environment? Marijuana, right? Yeah, so um, uh, cannabis sativa, indica, there's a few different varieties that are out there. But yeah, so cannabinoids. And basically, what's the, the main kind of psychoactive component of that? THC. THC, right. Delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC is what we're com commonly referring to it as. Now, this is uh, distinct from CBD. I'm sure that's something a lot of you have heard of. It has different actions, right? We're mainly talking about it from the GI perspective here. And so we have a couple of drugs that actually, um, you know, we can certainly give patients THC a variety of different ways and get the same effects out of this. We actually have synthetic versions that we can give instead. So one called dronabinol or marinol is probably the more common one. And so again, it's just an oral formulation. Um, we oftentimes will give it for uh, chemotherapy associated nausea and vomiting. We'll hit the chemo stuff next semester. I think that's the first thing we cover. Um, and this is good for patients who have um, failed other therapies. This is not normally going to be like the first line go-to sort of drug. It's pretty mild from an antiemetic sort of standpoint. But when you think about people who are, say, smoking a bunch of pot or something, what's one of those kind of common things you think about being associated with that? Increased appetite. Increased appetite, right? They get the what? The munchies, yes, they get very hungry. And so this is another big thing with that is that it will not only suppress that chemoreceptor trigger zone, so that way they are um, more, you know, less nauseous, they're going to be more likely to eat, but also stimulates that, uh, that appetite. So actually they want to eat something, right? Because you're going to find a lot of these chronic conditions, you see a lot of muscle wasting, you see a lot of poor nutrition because they just don't feel like eating. And so this can help out with a lot with that. Now, certainly you can still see some of the same kind of psychoactive effects as you do with other cannabinoids. You can see some confusion, some euphoria. Um, so this is a controlled substance, right? So it's going to be, um, you know, it's not a schedule one like you see with actual uh, marijuana itself, but still a controlled substance. They do have to have, you know, DA licensure and all that stuff to get it. But um, those are the biggest thing. Very well tolerated for the most part, but the biggest thing is just the appetite suppression, uh, appetite stimulation, and then the, the, the effect is an antiemetic. So this is not this is not CBD. This is just the tetrahydrocannabinol, just the THC component of it. Yeah, CBD has different actions. Um, it's really good for things like um, seizure control and some other things. We'll talk about that more when we get into the, the neurology section next semester for sure. Because that's a, kind of a big thing because CBD you can get access to even without a prescription, but you know THC itself is still considered that one substance. Is this something like a, a, a dispensary? Or like um, a this would not be at a dispensary. This would have to come from the pharmacy because this is actually an FDA approved product, right? So if you're going to like a marijuana dispensary, like they specifically just deal with that and just deal with like the actual plant product itself or the the um, you know the isolates out of that mm -hmm. 
So uh, pretty good drug, but only really going to be for those patients who are like chronic, like chemotherapy receiving patients, um, AIDS, HIV patients who are, uh, have like chronic muscle wasting, things like that for the appetite uh, uh, stimulation. We also have another class of drugs. This is pretty, very potent antiemetic. This is really reserved for those very severe cases of nausea and vomiting seen a lot with the chemo um, or chemotherapy patients are receiving. These are the substance P antagonists. Um, substance P, anyone know what that's normally used for in the body? Yeah, it helps with pain, right? So again, when you have um, pain signals being stimulated, that's where substance P comes into play. It's one of the components thereof. Um, it's actually one of the things that actually gets stimulated whenever you have access to capsaicin. Anyone know what capsaicin is? Peppers. Chili peppers and things like that, right? So um, when we talk about pain management, we'll talk about uh, capsaicin being used topically uh, to help with uh, substance P depletion and things like that. But it also has a very important role to play in causing uh, nausea and vomiting. And so if we can antagonize those substance P receptors more centrally, we can help to inhibit that nausea and vomiting associated with some very um, severe sort of uh, emetogenic drugs. Emetogenic just means it causes nausea and vomiting. So for instance, there's a drug called cisplatin, which is a very, um, very severe sort of uh, nausea and vomiting associated with that. Like if you get it, like you're just going to throw up, right? Um, and so basically what we can see is that not only we kind of have that acute nausea and vomiting in the first phase, but you also have this kind of delayed nausea and vomiting that can occur. And so this is where things like a prepotent or a min come into play here where basically we'll give them sort of an acute sort of dose and then we give it for a few days to help kind of deal with that delayed nausea and vomiting there um, basically just antagonizing this nk1 receptor and so um one thing to note though it does interact with CYP3A4 so you do have to watch out for dosing adjustments you may need to um, uh, potentially decrease doses of other drugs this will inhibit CYP3A4 okay it's good to know with that one and then up next we have our, uh, some prokinetic drugs and when i say prokinetic what does that mean also motility, right? It's going to help with stimulating stuff going through the GI tract. And so these are useful drugs if you have things like gastroparesis, which you can see like diabetic patients, uh, any kind of condition with dysmotility. This can really help out with that. And so metoclopramide is one of the big ones. Um, you'll oftentimes also see this used as an antiemetic drug as well, because it actually has very similar activities to something like a Phenergan or promethazine, where you have this anti-muscarinic sort of activity. And for a good long time before we had things like Zofran, we had to use uh, metoclopramide, especially for things like chemo-induced uh, nausea and vomiting. Kind of the interesting thing with this one is actually it's blocking dopamine 2 receptors. You see D2, that's not just my favorite movie, Mighty Ducks 2. Um, that is uh, the D2 receptor, the dopamine 2 receptor. And so by inhibiting that, you're actually suppressing acetylcholine release. And we saw that, um, you know, similar to if we block acetylcholine receptors, that helps with nausea and vomiting. But if we suppress release of acetylcholine, you kind of get the same effect there. Um, so that's one of the big things you're going to see with that. It can be very useful for helping with that nausea and vomiting. The other big thing is that prokinetic sort of activity here. So it's going to help to stimulate gastric emptying, motility. Um, so one of the big side effects you'd expect to see could be diarrhea, right? Even though you expect to see like anti-muscarinic, you see constipation, it can cause diarrhea potentially, okay? Um, so you see this used in a lot of cases, not just in the, um, you know, we, we use this a lot like in the post-operative setting. One of our anesthesiologists just likes to use Reglans, just what he's used to, and that's what they do. Um, so other things to note though, so whenever you're blocking D2 receptors, and we'll talk about this a lot when we get to the behavioral health section, because again, a lot of your antipsychotic drugs mm -hmm. work through blocking dopamine too. So this is actually in that same category as a lot of these other uh, drugs. Anyone ever heard of like Haldol? That's a very similar drug act, uh, from that standpoint. It blocks D2 receptors. So a lot of the same side effects you're going to see here. So one of the big things you're going to know is, is going to be this increase in prolactin. So whenever you block dopamine 2 receptors, you see an increase in prolactin. Prolactin normally does what? It will hit other hormones. What does it normally stimulate? Prolactin. Yeah, so for lactation. So normally when you're feeding a baby, do you need to worry about getting pregnant? Not normally, right? Your body's trying to say, hey, we need to feed this baby before you end up having another one. So you normally can do things like suppress ovulation because of that. And so this is one of those things where you can actually see that maybe, uh, you know, you have a pregnant or a female who's trying to become pregnant, has a hard time conceiving, they're on metoclopramide for some other unrelated nausea and vomiting. So it could be something you can see related to that prolactin. Um, those are big things to see with that. Another thing called neuroleptic malignant syndrome. We'll talk about this much more when we get to the behavioral health stuff uh, next semester. But it's, you know, it's a very severe complication of um, using some of these dopamine receptor blockers. Um, there's some other side effects. You can actually get some Parkinson-like side effects from these drugs as well. But we'll talk about that a lot more next semester. So just know that these are kind of the normal effects you'd expect to see from, from uh, Reglan. Another drug you can offer. Oh, yes, ma'am. Does it suppress ACH or does it increase ACH release? So it kind of depends on where it's happening at, but the big thing we're focusing on is just blocking those D2 receptors can help to suppress that acetylcholine release, and that's kind of the main focus there, right? Uh, so don't get too hung up on, on 
more details than that, just know, hey, Reglan, dopamine 2 re receptor blocker, because that kind of helps more with the side effects that are going to be associated with that uh, in an actual action for, for uh, antiemesis. Um, the other big prokinetic drug you're going to see here is going to be erythromycin. Now, where do we see erythromycin last? Back in the antibiotics, right? So you're like, well, why the heck are we using this in the GI section? Prokinetic properties, right? So again, I can tell you far and away, I see much more erythromycin being used for prokinetic purposes than I actually ever do for it being used as an anti-infective. We have other drugs that we can use instead, uh, azithromycin, clarithromycin gets used much more frequently. Erythromycin kind of has, especially in at least dealing with peds, we do this all the time. We have a ton of kids run this for the prokinetic properties. The reason for that is, and if you go back to the side effects we talked about with erythromycin, what was the big one we talked about? diarrhea because of the prokinetic properties here and so uh, basically what it's doing is stimulating those motilin receptors it has nothing to do with the actual mechanism of inhibiting you know protein synthesis in the bacteria it's actually just directly stimulating these motilin receptors you stimulate those you stimulate kinetic uh, uh, propulsion within the gi tract and then you get your hopefully fix your gastroparesis or fix whatever the issue is um, so obviously you can expect to see uh, cramps um, now this says impaired motility that seems kind of counterintuitive right so again, sometimes you have this issue where you become kind of dependent on these effects here. So again, it's one of those things where if your body's used to that modulin stimulation, all of a sudden you take it away, what can happen? Everything slows down, right? You have that receptor down regulation that occurs there. So you can end up seeing uh, this kind of withdrawal effect where they may have impaired motility associated with that. So just something to kind of keep in mind, but this is far and away what uh, erythromycin gets used uh, most frequently, at least from an oral standpoint. You still see some um, you know, ocular use for sure. Um, but yeah, this is the big thing you're going to see with is that. It because of tachyphylaxis and permotility? Kind Not of necessarily tachyphylaxis, more of a down regulation of those receptors so that way they uh, become less sensitive to it. So the normal um, compounds that would stimulate, you know, normal modulin that would normally stimulate those receptors, um, they just have less receptors to work with. Yeah. It's kind of desensitization, I would say, if anything. Mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> so we talked about things that help you uh, keep from things coming out of the top end. Let's talk about things that will help us to get things out of the bottom end, right? Uh, so we're talking about our laxatives here. So what are the different ways we can um, cause a laxative sort of effect here? Basically, what we can see is we can increase motility of the GI tract. We already saw that we can do that with things like metoclopramide. We can do that with erythromycin. We can try to increase the water content of the stool. Whenever you increase that, you're increasing kind of the, uh, you know, the, the stretch that's happening in, those, in that tissue there, and that stretch stimulates defecation. And then we can also do things like decreasing colonic water and salt absorption. So either we can try to draw water into the GI tract or we can prevent it from leaving essentially. All that's going to increase the volume of the stool. Normally when you get constipated, it's normally do because it's a very dry sort of um, thick stool that is just not really that uh, mobile. If you can try to increase the water content there, you try to lubricate it more, it's going to be able to pass a lot more easily. Now I'll tell you, uh, that working into Pete's ER, this is probably one of the biggest reasons for kids coming in. I'll never forget, I probably told you this story before, but uh, my cousin, he had this, uh, his daughter, she was probably like two or three at the time, and he goes, we're taking her to the ER, we're rushing her there, she's having the worst abdominal pain of her entire life. I was like, she's constipated. And he's like, no, no, she says this is the worst pain she's ever had, this is awful, or she's going to die. I'm like, no, no, she's just constipated. Sure enough, <laughs> they did a KUB, and what do they see? She's FOS, right? Full of stool. <laughs> find that and give her laxative boom she's all fixed she's like oh, i feel better I feel great so um so this is a big deal right and, and it turns out a lot of kids tend to be chronically um you know dehydrated and so a lot of this uh, we're gonna be focusing on for these drugs is to try to increase that water content it's the biggest thing so when might we use laxatives? We want to prepare someone for uh, bowel surgery, right? So again, you can try to flush everything out. So either if you're doing uh, colonoscopy or getting ready for surgery or anything like that. Um, in some cases, we may use laxatives to help us to increase excretions of toxins. So for instance, if I have someone with a lithium overdose, I can give them something to help kind of flush out the entire GI tract to get rid of it. Um, you can use these for post-operative stimulation. You usually see a lot of post-operative ileus or slowing of the GI tract afterwards. We want to stimulate that. Um, I forget, I had this one girlfriend who her dad was talking about when he was a little kid, um, he had surgery for something, I don't know what it was, right, appendicitis or something, and so one of the things they were looking for is like, hey, we want uh, the nurses and stuff were looking for him to pass gas or to have a bowel movement before they would discharge him home, but he always thought it was very rude to pass gas in front of people, so he would just always keep it in, they'd ask him about it, hey, if you pass gas, and he's like, nope, I haven't done that, so he ended up staying for like two or three days longer, he probably needed to, um, so eventually accidentally let one slip in front of the nurse, and then there you go. Um, <laughs> So other things you can see, you know, um, obviously relief of temporary constipation is probably going to be one of the most common things. Um, and again, a lot of these are available over the counter, so people are going to be self-treating with these, right? Um, obviously, these are going to be contraindicated in underlying bowel disease because you need to kind of fix that baseline problem, which the constipation may be sort of a side effect of, right?
So um, acutely, what you're going to expect to see from side effect standpoint is some nausea, abdominal cramping, diarrhea. Obviously, you expect to see diarrhea because this is what it's inducing, right? Um, now, one thing you do want to be careful of is to not kind of chronically use these uh, laxative agents because you can develop what we call this cathartic colon syndrome, uh, where basically you can end up having this atrophy of the outer muscle layers because you're kind of doing the work for the GI tract itself. So if it you know doesn't need to work all those muscles and kind of work normally, it's going to slow down and it's going to kind of atrophy there. Um, so you can especially when you find that um, with some of the classes like stimulant laxatives, people can become dependent on those. And then when you take them away, you're going to have this rebound constipation. So you have to be careful with those. Um, so a couple of different classes here. We're going to have our stimulants or irritant uh, laxatives. We're going to have bulk forming. This includes our dietary fiber, which most people probably don't get enough of, right? Uh, stool softeners and then our osmotic agents. So stimulants or irritants, these are probably the strongest ones that we have out there. These are also the ones I recommend using for the shortest period of time possible. Um, this can include things like castor oil, which is kind of a you know over-the-counter sort of like home remedy sort of thing. Um, the more common ones you're going to see from a prescription standpoint will be Cinna and Bisacodyl. Um, those are two of the big ones. And basically, they're just stimulating that GI tract to increase motility to hopefully just kind of force out whatever's there in, in the colon. Um, obviously, a big thing you're going to expect to see is it's you know, cramping, diarrhea, muscle weakness can happen with this. Uh, potentially, if they're um, going very frequently and they're kind of straining a lot, that can be a big thing you can see with that. But you know, be careful not using these too much because you can become dependent on them. And so when you have that withdrawal effect, you know, so if you're taking, you know, bisacodyl all the time and all of a sudden you take that away, then you can end up finding they will have a rebound constipation. So you got to be careful with that. Um, a lot of these other ones, you may not see that same or as strong of an effect. And, and so um, some of these are okay to use every single day, right? And so this includes your bulk forming laxatives. These are basically non-digestible dietary fibers. Basically, they're just trying to increase the water content, the, the actual, the bulk of the stool in the GI tract. And then that will help to stimulate that, that stretch that will stimulate further motility there. So this includes a lot of over-the-counter stuff, you know, things like psyllium husk, uh, methyl cellulose, like your uh, metamucils, things like that. Um, you know, basically they come as these powders, that typically that need to be mixed with water before taking. And by mixing with that water, it'll kind of form this nice, big, tenacious sort of um, uh, bulk within the, the, you know, the colon that will stimulate that, that propulsion there. And again, uh, helps to lubricate what's there in the GI tract as well. And again, can help kind of get rid of some of that stool, especially those really hard kind of thick balls that kind of form in there, right? You call them like the the rabbit pellets, you know, little rabbit turds uh, that form there. And it, because, but they get very dry and they're very hard to pass. And so again, by increasing that water content and, and you can lubricate it, it can be very useful to help kind of crawl, uh, to pass that. Um, now, be careful of the ever using these non-digestible fibers, as they will bind up with other drugs. So you need to make sure you're kind of separating them out. They're kind of similar to those bioelastic sequestrants we talked about um, many months ago. Um, but just be aware of that. Be aware there's going to be some cramping, some flatulence associated with it. those are part of the, the most common things. However, most People could probably use a little bit more fiber in their diet, and so this is uh, one of those things that's okay to use every single day. Um, now, can you ever can can someone abuse laxatives? Yeah. How could they do that? Yeah, for weight loss, typically, right? So again, if you're using a ton of laxatives, try to uh, so that would be one case you want to be kind of careful of uh, from a self treatment standpoint. Um, but again, the bulk formers are, are going to be very safe to use every single day, not a problem. Okay, uh, next we have our stool softeners. And so these are gonna be things that will help to be emulsifiers. They basically help to kind of increase the water content of the actual stool that's there itself. Uh, and so this can include things like your mineral oils, it can include things like your glycerin, and then docusase is probably one of the more common ones, the colase there. Um, so again, by lubricating the stool there, it's gonna help it to pass a little bit more easily. Now again, a lot of these products, how do you think they come as far as dosage forms go? Okay, so what route, I guess I should, by should, by mouth, typically, right? A lot of these are going to be by mouth. However, not everything's going to be by mouth. You also have some that are going to be available as uh, either a suppository, so it'll actually be inserted rectally, or they can be used as an enema, as we'll see for some of these. So for instance, you see like a lot of docusate suppositories, you know, Senna comes as a suppository. So um, just know there's different doses forms that are out there. Are any of these agents IV? Actually, no, yeah. So everything has to actually go through the GI tract here. So that's one thing to know. Um, but yeah, and then again, you have to be careful. Some of these um, are going to be, um, you know, sometimes you'll see some used in, in very small children versus other ones. Um, so for instance, like glycerin suppositories are very frequently used like in the NICU for very small babies uh, to help kind of then stimulate uh, defecation in those patients. Um, however, you know, you can have people that are taking mineral oil orally and that again, will kind of go through the entire GI tract. So uh, just another different routes that are out there available. And then finally, we have our osmotic agents. This can include things like magnesium sulfate. Mag hydroxide is probably the more common one. Now, we talked about mag hydroxide last time. Remember what we used it for? Hmm? 
Uh, well, yeah, so we do use magnesium, mag sulfate for torsades. Sure, that's from an IV standpoint, but how about from a GI standpoint? What do we use mag hydroxide for? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, right. It's an antacid. Remember, we oftentimes we're giving it along with aluminum uh, hydroxide, mixing those two together. Remember, aluminum causes constipation, magnesium causes diarrhea. So again, by mixing those two together, it kind of cancel out from an antacid standpoint. Well, you can use mag hydroxide by itself. It's called milk of magnesia as a laxative because basically it's going to help to, by giving the high mineral content of all that magnesium, you know, again, it's sort of a salt. So wherever salt goes, Water follows, and so you can increase that water content of the stools there. Um, other ones include things like lactulose, mannitol. And, and, uh, anyone know where we use lactulose for typically? Yes, yeah, so we'll use it for patients who have hyperammonemia. Uh, sometimes we'll give it for that. We're talking about it more specific as, a, as a, um, a laxative agent, but whenever you do talk about that drug from that standpoint, just know diarrhea is a very common side effect you're going to see with that. Uh, mannitol, and then probably the more common one, especially ever since I went over the counter, is going to be polyethylene glycol or. Miralax, right? Miralax is a very common thing you're going to find over the counter nowadays. Um, Go Lightly is another one. Anyone ever seen Go Lightly? It's for like things for, for bowel prep, right? Anyone see uh, what kind of volume it comes in? It's this powder. It comes in this big four liter jug, basically. And they say, fill it all up and they say, here you go, drink it all. Anyone know what it tastes like? Yeah. Disgusting. Disgusting? <laughs> Yeah, it's salty, right? Because again, it's a it's an electrolyte solution, right? So again, by drawing that water in, someone said it's like drinking warm sweat. Yeah, I was like, I don't want to do that. That sounds that sounds disgusting, right? Hopefully, you can chill it down a little bit first. But um, and again, a lot of people say there's nothing light about how you go when you take go lightly. So just, just be aware of that. Well, the mannitol have like the same effect, like the diuretic effects. It, 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 yeah, so mannitol, is a, mannitol doesn't really get absorbed. So when you use mannitol from a either like an increased intracranial pressure standpoint or from a diuretic standpoint, you're administering that IV. Mannitol doesn't get absorbed too well from the GI tract. So you don't necessarily see a diuretic effect. Uh, it should really just stay in the GI tract and then absorb that water in, right? Because if it did get absorbed, then it really wouldn't be able to do its job there. Mm -hmm. Where, how, what form are you taking mannitol in? This, this would be PO in this PO. case here. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, most of these would be PO in this uh, case here. So, um, all right, then up next, uh, obviously, you know, expect when you have one of these medications, you know, the osmotic agents are drawing that water in, they're going to help to increase defecation from that standpoint. Now, on the flip side, we have some antidiarrheal agents, right? So this is going to have to slow down the GI tract. We have a few here. They're going to help to decrease that motility. And a lot of them are actually working through the opioid receptor. So if you're familiar, anyone taking opioids, say, for pain control, what's the main side effect they talk about? Constipation uh, is a big one, right? You know, certainly see sedation, euphoria, et cetera. But the main thing is probably going to be impacting their quality of life is going to be the constipation aspect of it. So what's interesting about these drugs, they actually do not cross the blood-brain barrier. So they can't actually get into the spinal cord to work where the opioids normally do. However, they can work on the GI tract. Uh, so we will give these orally. They will be absorbed from there and then just affect the opioid receptors in the GI tract to slow things down, right? So these are good for anti-diarrheals. Um, you have diphenoxylate. Um, sometimes actually comes with atropine uh, as a, uh, with it as well. Now, atropine, anyone know what this drug does? It's an anticholinergic, anti-muscarinic. Normally, we don't actually see this being absorbed from the GI tract. What's interesting, though, is that people at one point were trying to abuse this, and they would actually inject the drug. And so you tended to find when you have big doses being injected, some of it would be able to by uh, bypass that blood-brain barrier. And so what they actually were uh, doing was putting atropine in with that drug. So if they were to crush it up and try to inject it, they caused themselves to be so sick uh, that they didn't want to do it anymore. That's kind of a deterrent. Um, so just know that's what that's kind of there for. But the main product is the diphenoxylate. That's the one that's mainly working there. And then loperamide or emodium is probably the more common one you're going to run into. Now, what are some of the problems you can find with using an antidiarrhea? When would you not want to use that? If someone has an infection, yeah, so if you have bugs that are growing in the gut, you want to make sure you try to get rid of those, right? So you don't want to hold on to them and they can then proliferate. So in cases of infectious diarrhea, probably do not want to use in these antidiarrheals. But just run in the middle diarrhea, kind of you know intermittent, totally fine to use these. We don't want to use these chronically because you end up having um, this kind of this toxic megacolon that can uh, develop here. So that is one of the things you can see with chronic use, but typically pretty safe when just used for non-infectious purposes, right? Uh, another one you're going to find is uh, also bismuth subsalicylate or Pepto-Bismol. Um, again, this has uh, several actions uh, to help to kind of inhibit intestinal secretions. Uh, this one can be pretty effective in infectious diarrhea. It doesn't actually slow down the GI tract so much, but can kind of help um, with, with fighting off some of those infections due to some of that salicylate that's contained in it. Um, and again, just be aware of uh, who should not get this drug. Kids. 
kids, kids less than 16 who are post viral, right? So you know, want to be careful with that. And then also bismuth, uh, potentially taking too much bismuth that can actually lead to some metal toxicity, which I'm not going to get into here, but just be aware of that. Remember what I said, how this shows up on an x ray? Yeah, yeah, so the bismuth is radio opaque, so it's going to be these like kind of little punctate radio opacities uh, that you're going to see throughout the, the GI tract. So if you see that, just know that's probably, just ask them if they took Pepto Bismol recently, and that's probably what it is. Okay, so then moving into talking about the uh, inflammatory bowel disease or irritable bowel disease irritable bowel syndrome. Um, the two big delineations here we're talking about IBD is going to be ulcerative colitis and then Crohn's disease. And have you talked about this already? Yes, Good. Okay, so we'll be able to cover the drugs uh, a little bit more detail here. But what, what's the problem? What's the main pathophysiology here? It's an autoimmune condition, right? So again, the, the, the immune system of the body is now targeting the GI tract and saying, hey, we need to fight off this tissue here. It's foreign. We don't like it. Let's get rid of it, right? And so what are some of the things you can see from that? Diarrhea, rectal bleeding, damage done to the tissue there, you know, uh, yeah, so it's very, very uh, painful for the patient, very, uh, un, uh, not, not very tolerable. And so what's kind of the difference as far as where the disease is between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease? Location. Location, so Crohn's is going to be? Yeah, Crohn's is going to be all throughout, ulcerative colitis more? Same with the colon, right? That's what it's right there in the name. Good. Um, that's going to be important because it'll help to guide us as far as which medications we're going to use, at least via which route. We're going to see, especially for UC, um, some of these medications are going to be uh, given as enemas that you can administer. Um, for Crohn's, you're going to find you need kind of more widespread use. And so either oral agents or you're going to find uh, we're going to need parenteral agents to help us out. So we'll look at some of those. And again, just like a normal immunophysiology versus when you have this malfunction, you see basically the immune system is just going to be just destroying that tissue um, kind of without uh, any kind of regard for it. So you can find a lot of the agents that we're going to use here are going to be, what's their mechanism could you suspect? Yeah, they're going to suppress the immune system. Good. Okay. So what happens if I suppress the immune system in these patients? You can get infection, right? So again, it's going to be one of the big side effects from a lot of these drugs is going to be secondary infection. You can see from this, right? Especially if you have an impaired, you know, um, gastrointestinal, you know, barrier. What grows in the back in the gut most frequently? A lot of bacteria, right? So again, if any of those start to translocate, that's where you can run into infection. So these are things you have to consider. So um, again, normally what you're going to find, they end up developing this kind of leaky epithelial barrier. All this like uh, T cells are going to be activated here. And so this is where a lot of our drugs are going to be working to help suppress the immune system, try to tamp this down. We're going to find that some of these are going to be agents that are very specific to attacking very specific targets. Some of them are going to be very nonspecific. A lot of the old school drugs we're using for a long time tend to be more nonspecific, kind of affecting the, G, uh, the immune system kind of from soup to nuts versus a lot of these newer agents are going to be very specific targeting things like TNF alpha or interleukin, things like that. And then you also find that a lot of these drugs that we use for um, uh, inflammatory bowel disease can also be used for other inflammatory conditions, right? So you see a lot of crossover between this and say something like rheumatoid arthritis, which we'll talk about next semester. But uh, as I mentioned, you know, ulcerative colitis is going to be mainly kind of located to the colon versus Crohn's disease would be much more um, uh, diffuse. And so that'll help us to guide which medications we're going to use, especially which routes we're going to be administering here, right? Okay, so again, I'm not going to get too much into detail on the pathophysics because you guys have already covered this, which is great. So getting into the therapeutic options here, the big thing we're going to see with ulcerative colitis is we're going to talk about our amino salicylates. We're going to talk about topical and oral. Now, when I say topical here, what do I mean? Like an enema or a suppository, something like that. When I say topical, I just mean actually topically to the GI tract. So if you think about it, people are just big tubes, right? <laughs> yeah. From... From out the anus, we're just one big tube. Um, so I say topical. Typically, I mean, that's still kind of the outside, you know, if you think about applying it to the rectum or something like that. So um, I don't mean rubbing on your skin. I mean, actually, you're going to be ministering it rectally. So when I say that, that's just what I'm referring to. Um, we'll also talk a lot about corticosteroids being used here. Again, we know these are very good anti-inflammatory agents. We'll talk about some of our monoclonal antibodies, some probiotics, et cetera. Um, in Crohn's disease, you're going to find that typically um, they'll have a lot of the same treatment options, but you're not going to find that we can administer things rectally. They need to be given orally, so that way they're going to have touch every single part of the GI tract versus with all sort of colitis some of our drugs are just going to be able to be used rectally okay okay so getting into the amino salicylates the most common ones we run into are going to be things like sulfasalazine basically this is a pro drug of sulfapyridine and this five amino salicylic acid right so it's kind of very structurally similar to, to aspirin there uh, basically gets metabolized by the colonic bacteria into these two products here and so by doing that you can imagine aspirin as an anti-inflammatory by what action 
Inhibit. Inhibits cyclooxygenase, and so that inhibits inflammation, right? So we already know how that works there. Um, same thing is basically happening here, right? So we're inhibiting that lipoxygenase pathway and the COX pathway, both through the sulfapyridine and the 5-amino salicylic acid there. Now, as far as adverse effects go, how might you see this manifest? Well, imagine if you inhibit COX enzymes, what can that do to, say, for instance, platelets? It'll inhibit them, right? So just like we saw before, so again, it could be some issues with uh, blood dysgrasias you can see develop from this, um, you know, some anorexia, diarrhea. Again, what are these patients likely developing anyway from their disease? Anorexia, diarrhea, abdominal pain. You know, so a lot of these things are going to be happening anyway, so it's hard to say, is the drug making this worse? Is it better? Um, so you kind of have to take that with a grain of salt. You know, just kind of see how things are developing for your patient with the addition of these drugs. And I'll talk about the dosage forms here in a minute. So uh, the other uh, common one we're going to see here is, also, is going to be called mesalamine. This is just 5-amino salicylic acid. And again, same mechanisms as what we saw with the sulfasalazine a second ago. Um, mesalamine typically has less adverse effects that are going to be associated with it. And you can see here there's a lot of different varieties that are available. They all have different brand names associated with them. Just know there's different dosage forms. So for instance, if I have a tablet here, you see DR it just means delayed release because, um, again, if you're using it for ul ulcerative colitis, you want to have a delayed release so that way the drug doesn't really start to work until it gets down to the colon, right? Um, so, again, tablets are going to be used orally. They're going to be able to touch much more of the GI tract. Um, here you can see that we also have things like suppositories. Again, depending on how diffuse the disease is, especially with UC, you may find that it's just more relegated just to the rectum, uh, which in that case, the suppository is great, you know. Um, something like an enema that you're going to find is going to be able to get a little bit higher up into the colon. So, you can find that, um, and again, we'll look at how far those enemas can typically get in just a few minutes here. But again, based on where the disease is, we'll kind of dictate what uh, dosage forms you're using. So um, another one we have called osalazine, which is just a dimer of mesalamine, which means two of them put together. It's a prodrug, colonic bacteria, to cleave it in half, and boom, now you have two molecules of uh, mesalamine. And then uh, basalazide is another one as well. It basically has that 5-acetosalicylic uh, acid there. So again, they're all going to have the same actions as what we saw with the self, uh, self a second ago. Now, looking at corticosteroids, uh, um, again, we know they're going to have uh, wide-ranging anti-inflammatory sort of effects there because, uh, again, they're working at the site of the nucleus, so kind of from the uh, top of the pyramid down, they're inhibiting inflammation. And so you're going to find that we have several varieties that are available here. So we talk about topical varieties. They're going to be administered uh, via the rectum. So we have things like hydrocortisone, which is used most frequently. Now, again, in the pantheon of corticosteroids, hydrocortisone, I think it's like super potent, less potent. It's pretty wimpy, right? So again, we're using kind of a wimpier sort of corticosteroid here, but because we can get a very high concentration right where the inflammation is, it ends up working pretty well. Um, so we have things like a suspension enema that can be administered, suppositories, the foams can even be used. Foams have a little bit better staying power uh, there in the colon when administered. So, for instance, you can see here, colocort, you know, it's given as a 60 ml uh, enema, again, given PR daily or twice daily. And again, from a patient compliance standpoint or patient ease of use standpoint, our enema is very convenient. Not really. So it's not great. And again, this is why um, this takes a major hit on their quality of life is because not only is their disease very disruptive to their lifestyle, but also having these medications that are not super great in the first place, just from a, a, a compliance sort of standpoint, right? Now, I do have some oral options here. We have things like budesonide, which normally you expect to see budesonide inhaled orally for things like asthma control. But here's one example we're using orally for um, inflammatory bowel disease. You can use things like prednisone, methylprednisolone. Now, the main goal here is if we can get them off of systemic corticosteroids, that is always going to be the goal. But just like any inflammatory disease, you're going to find it has peaks and valleys. You're going to find there's places where it's going to get exacerbated, places where it goes down to more sort of an indolent sort of phase. Um, when you have these exacerbations, that's where you want to kind of pick up your game and use these corticosteroids. If you can get them off of them in the meantime, that's great. Um, sometimes people need to be on these chronically every single day, but we know there's a lot of side effects seen with the corticosteroids. What are some of those side effects? Weight gain, edema, potentially cataract formation, osteoporosis, osteoporosis right, so calcium uh, dysregulation there, uh, hyperglycemia, right, so a lot of different factors seen with these, so in the infection, again, being another big thing as well. Um, and then for the very severe exacerbations, this is where you can switch over and use something IV, so hydrocortisone, uh, methylprednisolone, probably the two big ones you're going to see with that. So just be aware um, that if we can get them off the corticosteroids, it's always going to be a benefit, and that's where a lot of the newer monoclonal antibodies have kind of come into play, is they can help get that infl uh, inflammation under control, so you don't need as many of these corticosteroids. Okay, so then up next we have our thiopurines and then um, uh, some of our other anti-metabolite agents. Um, basically what these drugs are going to do, and we're going to talk about these more when we get into things like um, you know, cancer treatment and whatnot. Basically these are trying to inhibit the production of DNA and RNA. 
Okay, so again, you're going to find that we have drugs that are good for inhibiting DNA synthesis for bacteria, but these are going to be more geared towards human cells. Okay, and so as you might imagine, there's going to be a lot more side effects that are associated with these. So if you had to imagine, what kind of cells need to produce a lot of DNA? Cells. cells that are rapidly dividing, right? So again, this includes your, your immune system, right? The immune uh, includes the white blood cells. So if I can inhibit DNA synthesis, you inhibit the production of new white blood cells, thereby you decrease inflammation. Okay, so that's how these are kind of working here. Um, very similar to how we use some of these drugs for things like leukemias. If you have these rapidly dividing white blood cells, you can inhibit that by inhibiting their DNA synthesis, okay? So basically, these are going to be what we call disease-modifying drugs, uh, where they're trying to slow down the progression of disease, basically. All right? They're hoping to kind of keep things right where they're at, hopefully not making things get worse. And so they do take some time to kick in, three to six months in some cases here. You have things like azathioprine. You have things like 6 mercaptopurine, And again, you're going to find a lot of these get used either for things like transplant, where you're trying to prevent the body from attacking foreign material, like a foreign organ. Um, or in cases of things like leukemias, when we talk about cancer treatment, we'll talk about this again. Um, and so as you might imagine, myelosuppression is going to be a big side effect with this. You're going to see infections secondary to this, so you have to be careful with that, right? You're kind of monitoring levels, make sure they're not getting too high, make sure they're not getting further infections there. A couple other, yes, ma'am. Right, they're so the sulfur in it, but it doesn't mean that it's a sulfa drug, right? So again, typically your body's not just uh, responding to the sulfa, the uh, the sulfur element itself, because your body is replete with, with sulfur, right? We have it all throughout, but um, it's the larger molecule that we're kind of responding to. When you say sulfa drug, you're talking about usually a sulfonamide specifically, and so that's a much bigger molecule your body's kind of attacking. It's not just specifically the sulfa itself, or the, the sulfur, I should say. Yep. So, um, Anyway, so then getting into cyclosporin, this actually is working to inhibit uh, uh, IL-2, which helps to limit T-cell activation. Where did we talk about cyclosporin before? In the eyes. In the eyes, yeah. We use it as in restasis for chronic dry eyes. I'm so glad you guys didn't dump everything to that test. It's really good. Um, <laughs> Other things you can see with this, you know, you can actually end up uh, developing some nephrotoxicity, hypertension seen with this. Uh, so kind of an odd kind of mix of, of side effects you can see with cyclosporin. And then probably one of the more common ones you're going to run into is going to be methotrexate. Okay. Uh, this one's used very frequently for things like rheumatoid arthritis. Basically, this is a folic acid antagonist. Now, normally folic acid is used in the body to help produce things like um, thymidine, things like you need, uh, you know, nucleic acids you need to incorporate into DNA. So this is kind of working on a different step of the process here. And so typically you can see methotrexate used a lot in cancer treatment. But the big thing you're going to see with these drugs here is we're typically using lower doses than what you would normally see in cancer treatment, right? With cancer, we're trying to get rid of all those cancer cells. Here we're just trying to tamp down the immune system a little bit to try to keep it from overly attacking the GI tract. So we see um, methotrexate being used here. Again, you see things like stomatitis, because again, not only is it affecting rapidly dividing immune cells, what other cells are rapidly dividing all the time? Skin cells, right? And so that includes the epithelia of the GI tract. So again, you're constantly shedding and producing new epithelia there. So if you're losing those, if you can't, they're not replicating this. We can see things like stomatitis, nausea vomiting seen with that. Um, methotrexate also is really hard in the liver. So hepatotoxicity is, is fairly common there. Uh, you can see some dermatologic reactions. Again, we'll talk more about that when we get to cancer treatment next semester. But just know this is one of these drugs that can help to slow down progression of disease by tamping down that immune system. Now, the big ones that kind of changed everything uh, were the monoclonal antibodies, right? So these are relatively new in the grand scheme of things uh, from a drug standpoint. And so when you see MAB, you know it's a monoclonal antibody. What do I mean when I say monoclonal antibody? Well, it depends. It's just an antibody that we have specifically engineered it against a specific target here, right? So again, we can design it to attack any sort of target that we want. If I, I can design antibodies that attack snake venom, right? I use that quite a bit. Um, these are going to be designed specifically to help block the activities of TNF. Now, again, there are going to be new monoclonal antibodies that get released every single day. This is like the big blockbuster set of drugs. So, again, I can't even keep up with how many of them that are out there. So I will give you a few examples of them. I'm not going to cover every single one of them. If you go and work in GI, you'll get very familiar. These are the more common ones you run into. And just so you know, just because you see MAB on the end of a drug does not mean that it's always going to be a TNF alpha blocker. It just means it's an antibody that we've engineered to attack a specific target. So by attacking that target, it will bind it up and then prevent it from activating things like T cells, right? So for instance, we have things like infliximab, adalimumab. These are going to be these antibodies that are targeted against TNF alpha to decrease that immune response. If TNF alpha is not there to activate those T cells, guess what? They stay inactivated. Um, and so uh, being an antibody, how do I have to give this drug? 
Yeah, it has to be via injection, right? So usually sub-Q injections, things that patients can give at home. Um, in some cases, they may need to come into an infusion center to receive the drugs. It just depends on the formulation. So for instance, like infliximab, this has to be given via IV. So we have to bring our patients in to get infliximab every couple of weeks or so, every month or two months, uh, versus something like Humira it actually comes in a little pin that patients can inject themselves. So it'll depend on the dosage form, kind of depends on what works for, for those patients there. Also, if you had to imagine, what's the cost of these drugs? Very expensive, especially as opposed to something like methotrexate that's like older than uh, dirt. It's been around forever. Um, that stuff's cheap, right? I get methotrexate very, very cheap. This stuff is going to be hundreds, if not thousands of dollars. So again, oftentimes um, insurance is going to be playing a big role here. Oftentimes we'll have programs set up through the drug companies where they will actually try to um, help with the, the payment uh, for these things. So for instance, we have a program for uh, Humira for our GI kids uh, who are, um, uh, they basically get started their first dose is free while they're in the hospital and then the drug company will help them kind of set up uh, a way for them to get payment for it when they get out of the hospital, right? Uh, it's kind of like a drug dealer from a uh, illicit standpoint, they say the first hit's free, then you gotta pay. But they kind of help you along with the process, right? So hopefully they're not gonna leave the patient high and dry from that standpoint. But anywho, so you might expect um, that you need to uh, check for a few things before you actually administer these drugs. The biggest thing is to check for TB, right? You need to do a PPD before you administer these drugs because if the patient has a latent TB infection and you inhibit that immune system, it could reactivate. So you have to be careful with that and make sure you're checking for TB beforehand. Um, other things you can expect to see are going to be uh, secondary infections, both viral and bacterial are going to be a big risk here. Uh, so just be aware of that. Okay. Um, now, in some cases, you may see some kind of oddball side effects that we can't really explain away with just the mechanism itself. So for instance, if a patient has CHF, this can be worsened by these drugs. I don't know the mechanism, it just tends to worse uh, things like fluid retention and whatnot. It's just something that we see with that. So just be aware of that. And there is some risk for secondary malignancies, but they're typically pretty low. Um, something you know, we may have more information on as we give these drugs for a longer period of time, but they're still pretty new for the most part, right? And again, just note here, black box warning for increased risk of TB and opportunistic infections. You do need to be really watchful for that, okay? Okay, other things we can consider. There are certainly things like probiotics. I'm sure most people are at least somewhat familiar with probiotics. You may be eating some yogurt that has probiotics in them. Um, the main goal here is to try to make sure we're kind of keeping a normal gut flora here to hopefully prevent any kind of opportunistic bugs from sort of um, taking, a, uh, you know, starting to colonize and hopefully um, not in, kind of stimulating that immune system. So in some cases, there's a lot of different varieties that are out there. Um, a lot of the studies are not um, saying like gung ho, like yes, you absolutely need to have this probiotic on board, it's gonna help your UC, it's gonna clear, like, they're not that effective, right? But um, at least by having something on board, it's probably not gonna be a big problem. Um, shouldn't really cause any issues from uh, that standpoint. Right? There's some patients you do not wanna give these live bacteria to, uh, especially if they're severely immunocompromised, but this is not gonna be one of those cases here. Okay, other things you can consider, things like antibiotics, right? So some possible benefits here is if you can decrease the concentration of maybe pathogenic bacteria in the gut, that can be somewhat useful here. And hopefully trying to give that along with probiotics can increase the population of healthy bacteria versus the bad bacteria, that can be somewhat useful. However, um, it's not gonna be uh, purely evidence-based. Um, some people will, it's not gonna be one of those things that everyone either gets it or doesn't get it. It's kind of, um, there's not as much good evidence out there. However, uh, if you have a patient who's developed a fistula secondary to Crohn's disease, this is where this can be very important because if you're just sitting here, that fistula just kind of harboring that bacteria, you need to get rid of those. And so this is where you have something like either um, a cipro, a ciprofloxacin, no, has uh, some decent uh, anaerobic activity. It's gonna help to get rid of some of those bugs along with some gram negatives or metronidazole can be used here uh, additionally. Okay, some other ones you may see being used include things like tetracycline, rifaximin, but the big ones are going to be Cipro and metronidazole here. Okay, um, for use, and it's tough, I don't have a clock here to see how long I'm going for, so I'm going to finish up this section at least. Um, so as far as goals for treatment, so this is kind of the main armamentarium. Those are the main drugs we're going to be using for, for these cases here. Um, the goals of treatment, obviously, for UC are going to be to help to, to reduce that inflammation, hopefully induce remission if they're having acute exacerbation, and obviously improve their quality of life here. Okay. Now, again, treatment is going to be very dependent on the severity of the disease and also the location. So you can have some very mild cases that may be treated just with methotrexate, doesn't need any corticosteroids, they're totally fine. Some more severe cases are going to require things like the monoclonal antibodies, et cetera. So let's just look at some of these options here. Now, looking at the uh, the large intestine here, um, you can see that depending on how diffuse the disease is, our drugs are, not, are only going to be able to get so far, at least when they're administered rectally. So for instance, suppository, where do you think it's mainly going to be working at? Probably just the rectum, right? So again, if you had a much more uh, kind of just relegated just there to the rectum, 
that'd be totally fine, right? Um, versus something that's going to be a little bit more diffuse here. Say you have a left-sided colitis, um, your animus could probably get up here, right? You, uh, and again, you're fighting gravity in a lot of these cases here. Usually your patients are going to be kind of laying on their side when administering these uh, animus, so that way um, it can kind of help to decode the GI tract there. However, this is going to be kind of your limit here. If it's going to be much more uh, extensive and kind of affecting the entire colon, you're going to need oral options here because you're going to need something that's going to be able to go through the GI tract, through the small intestine, and actually get here and be able to treat all of these portions here, right? Unless you have some kind of way where you can like put your patient in some kind of thing to like flip them over and kind of rinse them. You can't really do that, right? Um, so again, topical products are going to be relegated just to um, proctitis and through left-sided colitis. Anything further than that, you need oral agents there, okay? So looking at this, and again, this is basically going to be a stepwise approach, right? So again, very similar to the other things we saw. You don't want to start with always the big guns. And sometimes it depends on how severe of a case they're having when it be, uh, begins here. So let's say, for instance, we're just dealing with the proctitis. Okay, first off, start out with the easy thing. Topical, 5 amino salicylic acids, include your sulfasalazine, your mesalamine, any of those ones are going to be totally fine here. And see, okay, well, does it work for them? If it yes, it does work, it's just stick with that. That's totally fine here, right? The nice thing about that is it's working very locally. You're not going to see a ton of systemic side effects from that, mostly just the GI effects, okay? Well, let's say, for instance, that it doesn't work by itself. This is where you can add on something additional. So let's add on now corticosteroid. So now I have a 5-amino salicylic acid as an anti-inflammatory, and now I have something like topical hydrocortisone I'm adding on top of that, right? So then they can work synergistically to help deal with that inflammation. At this point, if it's still not working, and again, it would be nice if you could try to taper off and just get back to the 5-amino salicylic acid. That would be best from a side effect standpoint. However, if not, this is where you can either go with both of them or you need to consider uh, bumping it up to something else, right? So we'll talk about using a little more extensive therapy in just a minute here. Now let's just say we're dealing with something like, you know, left-sided ulcerative colitis. Using a topical product may be well and good enough on its own, but if it's not, then that's where you need oral agents as well, right? So you have some oral 5 amino salicylic agents that can be used, and sometimes you'll see patients on oral and rectal. They can be used together depending on where the disease is kind of located to. But if that's not working, that's where you need to consider not using a topical corticosteroid, but using an oral corticosteroid. Budesonide is a pretty common one, hydrocortisone, um, any of these can be used uh, pretty frequently there. At this point, if it's still not working, this is where you want to consider using something like one of these, uh, these anti-metabolite drugs we talked about, something like an azathioprine, something like a 6 mercaptopurine that's going to help to actually deal with the immune system to try to start to tamp that down. This is where we're getting more systemic sort of drugs here. You're going to expect to see more side effects, more risk of infection, et cetera. So again, we're kind of working up to these, not just starting out with the kind of the biggest uh, guns in, in, in our arsenal there, okay? At that point, if it's still uh, things are not working, that's where we consider things like monoclonal antibodies, surgery in some cases, which is not really my purview, but um, this is where the monoclonal antibodies come into play here. Again, very effective, but very expensive, and you have to worry about the infection risk, okay? And always the goal is to try to taper off of things until you can get them back to kind of the lowest amount of drug they, they possibly need, right? So again, fewer drugs, lower doses, is always going to be more beneficial to your patient than, than more. So let's say they have more extensive or severe uh, ulcerative colitis. Again, this is where you're using a lot of combination therapy, using both rectal and oral agents here, and you're going to be more likely to add on things like corticosteroids, right? These are going to be a lot more used more frequently. You may have patients who are on corticosteroids every single day, potentially, depending on how severe their disease is. Um, and so this is where you get into uh, eventually the anti-metabolites, and then things like infliximab can be used here as well, right? Um, Adalimumab could be used as uh, additionally any of these antibodies are going to be working fine because they're both working to the same mechanism of attacking that TNF alpha. Now, if you had even more severe cases, and I'm and not really going to focus on this quite so much, but this is where we can get into things like IV um, cyclosporin A. This is where we get into things like, you know, getting into surgery much more frequently. So um, just know that start off with that stepwise approach. You know, uh, if I asked a question on a test and I said patients on, uh, say, for instance, uh, they're on, you know, just rectal mesalamine, you know, still having uh, side, you know, still having effects of the UC, what would be the next thing to, to go with? You can say, okay, well, I'll use a topical corticosteroid, right? I'll say it's a proctite. I'll make it very clear, you know, what it is, uh, not, not to leave a lot of gray there, um, but the other option would be, like, go straight to surgery, uh, start out, you know, infliximab or something else that would be ridiculous, right? Um, so, again, use that stepwise approach. Look to see what they're on and then what you can then bump it up to next, okay? Okay. For Crohn's, we're going to use all the same drugs for the most part, but you're going to find that um, the, the route is going to be much different here. And again, very same uh, similar activities or same uh, goals we're shooting for.
What you see with uh, Crohn's disease, you're going to find that we're going to be using more combination drugs right off the bat. So specifically, if you're worried about them having one of those fistulas or bacterial overgrowth, this is where you can use antibiotics. But typically, they're going to need to be on, because again, they have much more diffuse disease, on uh, something like a 5 amino salicylic acid plus an oral corticosteroid. Notice here, by going orally right off the bat, we're going to be able to coat the entire GI tract, and I'll just hit the, the colon, uh, as we saw with UC there. Um, again, looking at how they're going to be responding to this, especially to have like an acute exacerbation, this is where IV corticosteroids can be used. So sometimes you'll have patients who are getting admitted who for a flare-up where they have to get IV things like uh, IV methylprednisolone or things like that to try to get their that acute inflammation in, in, under control there. Okay. Again, using things like anti-metabolites are going to be used here as well, h bringing 6-MP, things like that. And again, if those are still not working, that's where you can eventually bump it up to something like an infliximab, adalimumab. And again, uh, it doesn't mean you always have to start right at this point here. If the provider feels that it's severe enough, you may want to start, start them up a little bit higher, right? So again, it depends on um, how the patient's looking, depends on the provider. If they've seen a million cases look just like this, they may go a few steps ahead. Right. But again, my questions will be more specifically asking, you know, uh, which of these would be, uh, you know, appropriate for ulcerative colitis versus Crohn's disease. And I'll have you want to know the dosage forms that are appropriate for that. You know, I'll ask you, um, you know, a patient has uh, extensive UC hitting the entire colon, which one of these would be inappropriate? Probably wouldn't ask a negative question, but you'd say, okay, well, the, the suppository is not going to be good for that. Um, you know, things like that. So those are kind of the questions I'm going to be asking here. Um, just know also to use that stepwise approach and try to scale things back whenever possible. Okay. Okay. Uh, they have more refractory. This is where, again, you can have your monoclonal antibodies here. I'm starting to see more people kind of jumping to the monoclonal antibodies before they actually end up hitting the 6-MP and the azathioprine. It just depends on the case, um, how severe the cases are. These are very good for getting things under control and then eventually you may be able to scale it back to something like a methotrexate or something. So it really just depends. Um, from a side effect standpoint, you know, adalimumab, because it's so specific, for hitting just that TNF alpha, you tend to see less sort of side effects than we see with like a methotrexate. So a lot of it depends on cost, a lot of it depends on um, other patient factors as well. So again, it can be very individualized depending on the patient. Okay. Okay. Uh, again, as far as maintenance goes, again, you want to try to um, scale things back, as I mentioned, um, you know, depending on um, what's going on here. We try to have no corticosteroids on board as much as possible because uh, with ulcerative colitis, you can get away with using topical corticosteroids. Those are okay. You can see patients are on those chronically. However, for um, Crohn's disease, you try to get them off the corticosteroids as much as possible because, again, by giving it orally, you're going to see systemic effects from that, and you want to try to prevent that as best you can, right? Again, do people outgrow Crohn's? They outgrow ulcerative colitis? Not typically, right? It's going to be kind of a lifelong sort of thing. So you want to kind of find what works for them, have a plan in place for when they have these exacerbations, what they need to step it up to. You may give them, uh, you know, an as-needed prescription for corticosteroids. Say, hey, if you have a flare-up, if you notice these symptoms, go with this. Try this before coming in. You know, some things like that. So um, if you work with these patients, you have much more experience with them, you'll know what to do. Okay, so any questions on that? How do they use the topical thing as those can fit with? Hmm? Using the topical, like topical corticosteroids, yeah. if we start the therapy, so how are we administrating it? Like how does the patient, and what part of the colon is it only going to So it's only going to be left-sided? If you have a left-sided uh, ulcerative colitis or a proctitis, like that's where the co topical corticosteroids are going to be kind of relegated to. Um, and again, they're usually given by enema, there's foams, you know, things like that. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. again, we have topical corticosteroids you talked about being used for Derm stuff, but we're talking about topical here in terms of the, the GI tract. It's a little different there, right? Is derm on this test? Can't remember. No, we did that before. So you don't have to worry about getting those two conflated. <laughs> it's good. Thank goodness, right? Don't get all your topicals mixed up. Okay, so let's do a 10-minute break. We'll come back and then start with the renal.